We have like 450 women at our most powerful women's summit. This is this is, this is amazing. So thank you all for coming. And it's kind of thrilling to be first in line at this conference, isn't it? It's super exciting. It's a big responsibility. It really is. <laughs> I mean, we're setting the tone, Lila. We are. I'm glad so, I had my coffee. So <laughs> yes. So uh, we want you to know that we work really hard at prepping for, event, especially for an event like this. And what Lila and I did was three weeks ago, we we, we've known each other for years, but not well. So we went abroad. We went to the British Virgin Islands, <laughs> to Richard Branson's Necker Island, and we embedded. <laughs> we roomed together for four nights <laughs> and prepared diligently for this <laughs> session. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. In the, wor in the small world we live in, Lila, you can explain. Yes. Uh, I was at a conference the week before, and I happened to sit next to a guy who was organizing an event on Necker Island. And so two days later, he pings me, and he's like, we have a speaker who's just dropped out. Would you mind coming to Necker for a week, and we'll pay all of your expenses, and it's a private island. And he's like, and you'll be rooming with the woman who runs the most powerful women's event at, at Fortune. And I said, let me think about that. <laughs> but it was definitely like the highest end roommate experience I've ever had. Oh in my, my God. Life. <laughs> Mutually. Yeah. I mean, this guy called me and said, we asking you a favor, would you take a roommate? It's this really amazing w w woman who lives in San Francisco. And she's I'm like, and he wouldn't tell me who it is. And I said, who is it? And he goes, Lila Jana. I'm like, yes. <laughs> OK, so we are well prepared for this. And Usually, I mean, not usually, sometimes I like to start interviews on stage by asking a question that is always telling about how a person's career path ended up becoming. And I think it's especially appropriate to ask this question of Lila, and that is, what did you want to be when you were 17 years old? <laughs> So uh, I always wanted to be a marine biologist. I grew up watching those old Jacques Cousteau documentaries, and I grew up right on the ocean in Southern California. And then uh, when I was 16, I got $10,000 from a big tobacco company, which I know sounds super weird. I was <laughs> I'd applied for a scholarship, and the Lorillard Tobacco Company had given me a $10,000 college scholarship. And I ended up using that to go to Africa. So by the time I was 17, I was in rural Ghana, totally randomly um, because of big tobacco. And, um, and I decided then, after working with people who are living in poverty, that I wanted to dedicate my life to doing something about global poverty. Um, and it hasn't been the straightest trajectory since then, but I'm happy to say that I'm still working on that now. So then you, later. then you go to Harvard. And while you're at Harvard, you're thinking, what? <laughs> so, uh, so for some context, my, my parents come from India. And I grew up, uh, I don't know how many of you are from immigrant families, but I'm sure you guys have heard the story of like, our lives were so much harder than yours. <laughs> and you need to eat all the food on your plate because there are starving kids back home. And so that was like the refrain in my household growing up. And I had never had any connection to those starving kids back home because I had grown up uh, going to nice American public schools. And you know I'd grown up in the suburbs. And so I had always had this interest in understanding where my parents were really from and, um, and what poverty was really like. And, and then when I got this chance, when Big Tobacco gave me 10 grand, <laughs> um, I decided to use the opportunity to go and do like a service learning trip. And so really I wanted to have an adventure and do something fun before college. And, and I ended up going to Ghana and teaching at a school um, in a rural part of Ghana. And I had this total awakening my students, who I thought were going to be poor and desperate and helpless, my students could name US senators. They listened to Voice of America radio. They were more informed about world affairs than a lot of Americans I knew. And I realized that we have this myth about poverty, which is that poor people are helpless, and that they need handouts, and that they need us to give them free stuff, and that that's the best way to help them. And what I discovered in Ghana is that um, we don't live in a global meritocracy. I happened to draw a winning ticket in life's birth lottery by being born in the US. And that it really wasn't fair that so much of the world's population is systematically deprived of any chance to exercise their full human potential. 
And so I ended up, you know, being really, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, I ended up just getting really curious because I, I saw all these bright kids and they would stay after class and ask me questions about American you know, schools and ask about writers I knew and, and they were just like sponges yearning to learn, um, to learn whatever I had to, to teach them and it struck me as so bizarre that people with this high degree of motivation and skill could be so poor. And that curiosity about you know, what drives poverty is what led me to study that at Harvard. It wasn't a very popular major. <laughs> um, I had to actually design my own major to understand. It was, it was called International Development Studies um, to really understand what are the drivers of global poverty. And it was, um, it was also seen as quite bizarre by my classmates. Um, many of them were like working at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs over the summer, and I would like go to rural Africa <laughs> and, um, and try to raise a little bit of money before I went doing odd jobs. But when you returned from Ghana, when you were 17, you also got a lot of letters from the kids you had taught there who actually were basically asking for handouts yeah. and saw handouts as the solution, yeah. which made you think there needs to be an alternative, right? Well, so what's so bizarre about this world of international aid, and I think it's, it's absolutely true here in the U.S. as well, um, is that we've almost trained low-income people to expect nothing better. And what I realized in Ghana, you know, my students uh, were, I was working at a school for blind, for blind people, so a lot of the letters came in Braille when I got back, um, and many of them had brothers and sisters who would write me these letters asking for stuff. And just to give you some context, I was staying in a rural village that was like two and a half hours away from any kind of infrastructure. So to get like an aerogram, you know, to get even the paper to write me a letter, they'd have to go quite far. They'd have to travel on a bus. They'd have to go get this paper. They'd have to then write it up. And then they'd have to go figure out how to mail it to me in the US. And that takes quite a lot of effort. And the things that these people were asking me for, they were like, will you send me a box of pencils? Um, one kid asked me for water, for drinking water. Mm. And it was like heartbreaking because I thought if you have enough effort, I mean, what American kid is going to send anyone a letter these days, right? Like if you have enough effort to go and buy a piece of paper and write out a nice letter and, you know, put a drawing on it, then clearly it's not for lack of effort that you're poor. Um, and so what struck me then is that we essentially trained these young people to expect handouts and to, and to think that that was the only way that they might make money. And actually, if you're in their situation with very few income generating opportunities, probably the best way you can make money is to write letters to the one rich American who showed up in your village. <laughs> so we want to get to explain what SAMA is. So I'm going to jump ahead. You graduate from Harvard in what year? In 2005. In 2005, you start working on this company and you launch it in 2008 and basically it is it's it's built on the concept and i think you kind of uh fashioned this word yourself micro work so explain sure uh, so i had been looking ever since i left ghana for ways that i could create employment for low-income people because what I heard nonstop throughout my time at Harvard and even in Ghana, whenever I worked for a nonprofit in Africa or Asia, when I actually talked to poor people and spent time with them, they would say, it's wonderful that you guys are working on building this well or building a road to my village, but what I really want is a job. So can you get me a job? Can I be your cook? Can I be your driver? Can I be your translator? And so it struck me that what poor people need most is income generating opportunity. What the, the best way to address poverty is by giving work, right? So I was searching for ways to give work to lots of people. I read Muhammad Yunus's books, um, mm -hmm. the founder of Grameen Bank, who came up with the idea of microfinance. And uh, in 2006, I stumbled into the world of outsourcing. I was a management consultant for two years after I graduated from college to make some money and learn about the business world. And, uh, and I discovered this giant global industry that most of us know from call centers. You know, when you call up the person who's, or you call the 800 number on the back of your credit card and you get someone random in India. Um, well, that industry is like a trillion dollar global industry. And I realized that there were basic tasks, basic tasks that could be done through the internet that we could train low income people to do. And we could harness that industry to serve the poor in the same way that Muhammad Yunus harnessed the banking industry to serve the poor with microfinance. And that was the genesis of this concept of microwork. Essentially, microwork is just um, breaking down big digital projects into small tasks and then training low-income people to do those tasks from the regions that they're from. 
So um, what it looks like in practice is we now have over a thousand full-time workers, more than half of them are women, who earn about four times the average local wage doing small digital tasks, things like image tagging or data entry. Um, there are all of these these new digital tasks that need to be performed for the internet age, and, uh, and tons of, of companies right here in the Bay Area who use our services. And those companies include? Uh, they include Microsoft, Google, TripAdvisor, Getty Images, um, a very large auto company that I can't name on okay. stage. Um, but, uh, but any companies that have big data, big messy data problems, we can help them structure and organize that data. And when you, so this is sort of a chicken and egg thing. You need the workers and you need the companies. Which does it start with? So um, when I started, I was not at all interested in building like an outsourcing company. I mean, this industry is super boring. All the conferences are like middle-aged men in like Orlando. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I guess not that different from the tech industry. Um, but I, <laughs> I definitely did not like aspire to start an outsourcing company. I aspired to start a poverty alleviation organization. I wanted to build a new kind of nonprofit that would actually measure how many people we moved out of poverty and by how much every year. Uh -huh. And I wanted to do, again, I wanted to do something like what, what Muhammad Yunus had done, and I wanted to be able to prove that we could use technology truly for social good. And when we talk about social technology in Silicon Valley, usually we're referring to like Snapchat. Um, I thought that we could build a new kind of social technology that would actually measurably improve the worst off people's lives. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we harness this as a tool for that. So, we, so I started with the workers. I started with trying to understand what kinds of populations could do this type of work. And we started in Kenya with young people from the slums mm -hmm. who were living on under $2 a day in the most squalid conditions. And we, we realized that we could train these people, who, many of whom spoke English, just like my students in Ghana, it's a similar population, to do data entry. And so we won a very, our very first contract from a Bay Area nonprofit that actually has a big uh, library for blind readers called Bookshare.org. And they needed people to digitize, to basically turn these PDFs of books into digital files mm -hmm. that could be read by audio software on this website. So we employed, when we got started, it started with four workers in Kenya, four young people from the slums who were doing this transcription work. And then we grew to 50, and that kind of kept spiraling. And now, um, to date, we've moved about 7,600 workers from under $2 a day to over $10 a day, which is... Wow. Um, so how do you recruit these work? And now you're operating in how many countries abroad, and now you're in the United States, I know. That's right. We started in the US a couple of years ago um, uh, with a program called Sama School, which is a slightly different model, but it's a similar concept of engaging low-income people in the digital economy. Mm -hmm. um, we're now in Kenya, Uganda, India, and Haiti, and the US. So how do you recruit these workers? Do you basically sort of like place local ads and say, this is your opportunity, and is it very competitive? Do you pick these workers carefully? So um, we, we wanted to figure out, as a nonprofit, how not to reinvent the wheel. I mean, there's so, much, there's so much duplicated effort in the nonprofit industry, and we wanted to avoid that. So we went out and we figured, you know, there are so many local NGOs in these communities, so many local nonprofits. In the Kenyan slums, there are dozens and dozens of local organizations that serve the poor in those slums. So we thought, why not reach out to them and say, hey, we have this new program. Can you refer people to us? Uh -huh. um, those nonprofits love it because it makes them look good. Right? right, they they're able to show that they have good outcomes for their populations. Mm -hmm. um, so we recruit through them. Um, okay. We do we do local ads. A lot of those uh, organizations do local radio ads. Um, they they have boots on the ground in the community that go out and recruit people. Now Sama is a nonprofit, and you've raised a lot of money over the years to to fund this very um, impressive and. Um, impactful in a wonderful way, nonprofit. Uh, but you really, you've come to believe that that model of raising money for a nonprofit is a bit antiquated and you're looking to turn that on its head. Yes, there was a Fast Company piece that ran, I think it was a month ago, um, and a bunch of our donors saw it and, and laughed because the first line is like, I cannot stand fundraising or something like that. Um, and so I, I hate it. I mean, if, if any of you guys have done fundraising, either for a for-profit or a non-profit, but I think 
with a nonprofit, it's especially hard because you're not promising anyone a financial return, so you feel extra beholden to your donors. Uh -huh. It's a very weird dynamic, especially as a young woman raising money from lots of older men. Um, you can imagine the dynamic that that creates. So uh, over the years, I've had to basically beg people, you know, go out with out outstretched hands um, around the world to fund our work. And I think it's, uh, it's both not sustainable for a founder uh -huh. um, and not sustainable for an organization. And so early on, we were really excited about the concept of social enterprise. Again, you know, borrowing from Muhammad Yunus, um, Social enterprises are so much more powerful than traditional nonprofits because if you combine an earned revenue strategy with traditional fundraising, you just can extend you know, your work so much longer, mm -hmm. right? And so the, my favorite nonprofits are organizations like Goodwill, which probably all of you have heard of, which actually does uh, close to $4 billion in annual revenue um, from in-store sales. And, and their operations are mostly funded by that revenue. And what a beautiful model that is, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have to go out begging for all of the capital to run to run their organization. And so, um, so early on, we wanted to, to, be, to really build on that social enterprise model. So we always had about half of our revenue coming from these contracts with tech companies. This year is so exciting because we will break even off of our earned revenue as a nonprofit, fantastic. which is really tough to do. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is fantastic. OK, and now you've, as if all this is you know, not enough, You've started a beauty company, and it's called Lakshmi, which means? Uh, Lakshmi refers to the Hindu goddess of beauty and prosperity. Not Padma Lakshmi, although a lot of people have asked about that. <laughs> and by the way, uh, Sama means equality in Sanskrit, right? Yeah, it means equal or balanced. Equal, OK. Yeah. Um, so how does, how does Lakshmi work, and how does it relate to Sama? So a couple of years ago, I was in northern Uganda, um, which is a war-torn region. Uh, some of you might have seen the Invisible Children video about Joseph Kony, who's this local warlord who's um, perpetuated this horrendous civil war in the region for a decade. And so this area has recently emerged from that civil war. Uh, tons of people were former child soldiers and totally traumatized. There's a huge need for industry and for jobs. Now the new war that's being waged in this, in this region is, is the war for jobs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was there a few years ago. We have a Sama center there that's employed about 400 people. So I go back on a regular basis. And I came across this local product in a market um, called Nilotica. It's a type of shea butter that comes from East Africa. It's incredibly soft, and I started using it on my skin just because I, I love finding local products. And it dawned on me that this could be a path to more employment in the region than we were able to create as Sama. Hmm. And I thought, well, what if we could take the Sama model of giving work through technology? What if we could build something similar in a different industry? And what's so exciting about the Lakshmi model is that we're able to employ very low-income harvesters who don't have any education whatsoever. Most of them are illiterate. It reaches a different population than the Sama population, which is typically high school educated local people who still earn less than $2 a day, but have had some education and some opportunity. So Lakshmi reaches even further down, um, down into, I'd say, the, the lowest rung of the economic ladder. And, um, and I had this idea, well, if, if we could build this concept of give work beauty, what if we could transform people's idea of what a beauty or a luxury brand could be? Um, I don't know if, if any of you guys use you know, Creme de la Mer or any of those fancy skincare brands, but you know, la Mer is, is $200. Um, it's a great skin cream. It happens to be petroleum-based, um, so maybe not the best thing for you. Um, but I, I thought, why, what if we could build a, a luxury concept around a truly natural and organic product that also had a fair trade and give work element? What if we could tell the world that if you're spending $200 for your skin cream, not only should it make your face look better, it should make the world better. We should demand more of our luxury products. And, um, and I, I think there's so much appetite for that. We ended up um, getting funded by Tom's, uh, which has a new, the shoe brand Tom's has a new social enterprise fund, and a bunch of other amazing investors came together and, and helped us raise uh, for our seed round last year. And, and I think that Tom's proves, Tom's and so many other brands that are appealing to millennials, um, proves that young people expect more out of their products. They want something that's gonna be socially impactful. They don't wanna just buy the, the brand that their, that their moms bought or that they're, um, you know, they, they are demanding more than the previous generation did. 
And I, and I think that's the opportunity. So how does this connect with Sama? So uh, at the outset, I told my board at Sama that I wanted to build this brand so that we could build some additional capital for Sama. And so I donated a third of my equity to the nonprofit. Um, so the nonprofit owns more than 10% of the luxury brand, which I think is unprecedented, as far as I know, in the luxury skincare and beauty space. Interesting. Um, I know we're supposed to have a flashing light for when our time is mostly up, and I'm not sure where that appears. You don't see it, do you? Someone will just come with a hook and pull us off. <laughs> so someone should come with a hook, because I'm not seeing any lights or timers. Oh, it's down there. Oh. Oh, I think we might be, like, out of time. But you have to get out of your seat to see it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, well, there you go, okay. So I'm going to, I think we're out of time, but I'm going to ask you one more question because I'm starting a company. I just, I just launched a company, Sellers Easton Media, a month ago. Yay, thank you. After 32 years at Fortune, I'm still half time there uh, overseeing most powerful women events. Um, but you're a pro, so what is your best advice, Lila, on starting a company? It is so hard. I just did a video yesterday on imposter syndrome, which I still deal with like every day. Um, I would say that the best piece of advice I have for starting a company is what Ben Horowitz uh, said. He's a legendary venture capitalist um, and one of the partners at Andreessen Horowitz. My favorite line, which I have in my office, is don't punk out and quit. <laughs> I think I need that as a second tattoo on my other wrist. So, um, <laughs> what does the first tattoo say? Sama. Sama. There we go. Don't punk like out it. and quit. Thank you, Lila. <laughs> this is great. Thanks.